Hello and welcome to the big picture. For years we have been hearing the lament about the higher education system in our country has been languishing with a few oases of excellence of course. It was both the Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh and President Pranab Mukherjee to lament lately about the sad state of affairs of our higher education system. The meeting of Vice Chancellors of Central Universities convened by President Mukherjee in the capital during the last two days saw much discussion about how to improve the quality even as the quantity has been taking a quantum leap both in terms of students entering higher education as well as the budget being allocated to it. With India aiming to become a knowledge power in the next decade, it is inevitable that the quality be improved. As Prime Minister pointed out in his address to the Vice Chancellors, expansion without quality serves no purpose. So where does one start while improving the quality? What are the roadblocks which have been faced so far? Is privatization of higher education the answer, as President Mukherjee suggested? We will look at all these issues today. To discuss this, I have with me an eminent panel of guests, Professor Syed E. Hasnain, former Vice Chancellor of Hyderabad University and presently a professor at the IIT and member of the Science Advisory Council of the Prime Minister, R.P. Agarwal, former Secretary of Higher Education in the Union HRD Ministry, Professor Aditya Mukherjee, eminent historian at the Centre for Historical Studies, JNU, and Professor C. Rajkumar, Vice Chancellor of OP Jindal Global University at Sonepat near Delhi. Welcome to all of you. Uh, professor Hasnain, I would like to come to you first. Global standards, we don't meet global standards and the lack of quality, you know, is, are they too interlinked? I think it's a very good question. We need to ask this question, what is meant by global standards? Are we playing a level playing field? We are asking ourselves to get ranked by agencies which look at parameters which do not exist for India at all. Okay. How else do you, how will you expect Can you, can you, can you, can you I'll tell one you. or two parameters? I'll tell you, first yes. of all, foreign faculty. Yes. Second, corpus fund. Which of our central universities have a corpus fund? How many of our universities have foreign faculty? What is infrastructure support? These are, how many Nobel laureates, fields, medalists do you have? These are parameters on which DHES ranks, okay. on which Beijing ranks, on which QNS ranks. Okay. We, these parameters will never be. Okay. I think the problem is, let me say, uh, to the embarrassment of few, we are perhaps obsessed with not being ranked internationally. Okay. Look at our, without being ranked, we have created brand names like IITs. Right. Like IIMs. Right. Like uh, All Indian Institute of Medical Sciences. Like Indian Institute of Science. These are brand names. Absolutely. So and they have, been, have, they have been there for decades. For decades and nobody says, you, there, there's a mad rush to grab these, these people coming from these brand name, branded institutions. Right. There, none of these have been ranked in the top 100, top 200. JNU. JNU, <laughs> Hyderabad University, <laughs> Delhi University, they're right. all good names. Yes. Look, look at the, I think we have very lopsided and I, as I said, to the extent of being obsessed with not getting ranked international rankings. I think we need to come out of this mindset. Mr. We need to create our own. Mr. Agarwal, do you agree with that? Well, you have been part of the system. You have yes. the Secretary of Higher Education. Was <laughs> this global ranking a very major factor in deciding whether you are doing, whether our system is, has good quality or not? Well, uh, Girish, uh, I mean, I agree to a great extent with uh, Professor Hasnan, but would not entirely agree with him because, you know, while uh, this foreign faculty and uh, foreign students have a weightage of about 5 to 10% in these three different rankings. Uh, but primarily our research output, yes. publications per faculty, I think uh, comes out to be comparatively much lower. Okay. The patents applied by the, our the the cut, research deficit. The cutting edge research. Research deficit yes. is something which is, I think, pulling us down. Right. While the Nobel laureates or field uh, medals in mathematics and things like that, we may not have. There we do suffer to some extent, but if we were having enough research publications and research output comparable to global standards, I'm sure still we'll make it to the top 200 rankings of Geotang or Times Higher Education Supplement or Kakarli Siemens. Right. So while they need to be slightly tweaked for our situation, but I think there is a need to improve. We don't meet the research global standards. We hardly publish 3.3% uh, of the total publications of the world. Okay. And out of those publications also, our citations per paper is 5.7. Right. 
as against the world average of 10.8. Okay. Which, of course, luckily we are better than China in this. Okay. <laughs> And our total patent... Maybe, maybe because of the uh, language uh, advantage which, uh, which we have. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, on the research side, again, hardly 4 to 5% of the total research done in the country gets done through our educational institutions. As against that, the ballpark figure for UK would be 25%. Okay. Canada is about 35%. So I think... Firstly, the research itself, we hardly spend 1% of our GDP on research. Out of that also, what gets done through our educational system, I think is mini school. So I think there I, is... I remember why Professor Turad was here on, the, on our program one of the, uh, some time back, and he was mentioning the kind of funds which are allocated to, you know, he's, he's the chairman of the Indian Council of Social Science Research, and things like that. there's a lot of uh, problem with funds. Anyway, uh, coming to you, Professor Mukherjee, uh, do you agree with both of them? One second thing is, is research the key factor while, you know, uh, talking of quality? So I agree partially. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt that who determines what, what uh, is quality, you okay. know. So when, when global ranking is done, so if somebody else, we do not hand over to any other set of people the right to decide what is good. But that doesn't mean that there are no objective bases right. for knowing what is good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we, in the Nehruvian period, for example, when we set up the IITs, etc., we didn't first get a global ranking, you know. It, we did our thing pretty well. Right. But the important thing, I think, is that how to be globally com competitive. Right. All the names you mentioned are things that had happened in the 50s. Right. You know, this is the Nehruvian period when right. India was poor. Now, what have we done since? You know, there last, is a, com last there is a 20, complete... Say, the last hmm? 30 years or 40 years, has there, have we been able to create a institution of such excellence. To totally, total mismatch right. between the resources at our command, command and what we are doing. One JNU? I mean, look at, look at universe countries with which we compare ourselves. When you talk about the United States, you know, you are talking of a hundred universities which are good. Yes. You know, where, where, a degree in which, where it matters. In my discipline, I can't find two. Exactly. You know, I mean, isn't that a shame that after 65 years of independence, we have created, we have completely failed I must say, with all apologies to the government, bureaucracy, everyone, <laughs> everyone eh? if the biggest failure for India since independence has been in the sphere of education, and particularly higher education, where we had a head start over everybody else. Right. Over every other third world country, we had a head start. And we're, what a mess we have made. We, we, we want to be global. We want to follow global patterns. Globally, the thing is you recruit the best. Hmm? If you want to set up an institution, recruit the best. Internationally, we look will, at China. How they are recruiting. We will, we will come know? to the we will come to the, the standards of teachers and things like that a little later. But I would like to go to my uh, other guest, uh, <coughs> Professor Rajkumar. You are you are the vice chancellor of a global university. Just now, Professor Mukherjee was talking about a glo you know global standards mean global university. It's a private university which has been set up recently. What is the purpose? Do you think that you know your university will be able to? Uh, in a few years' time, come up to these global standards which are being talked about at the government level, at the prime minister level? First of all, let us welcome the fact that this issue has been raised at the highest level. Both President Pranab Mukherjee as well as our Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, Absolutely. has brought this issue to the central focus. Right. We also need to understand that historically, uh, the last three decades or so has also seen an extraordinary degree of commitment on the part of countries in Southeast Asia right. to raise the quality of institutions. Right. Yes, if you look at the QS World Universe Rankings, the Times Higher Education Rankings, as well as the Shanghai Jiotong Rankings, much of the universities are from the Western world. You have some of the leading universities in the US, in Canada, in UK, in Europe, and Australia, significantly represented in these rankings. But what we need to understand, at least from the Indian standpoint, is there are also a fair number of universities from Singapore, Hong Kong, South Korea, Taipei, Japan, as well as mainland China. Right. And in particular, these countries in Southeast Asia have significantly improved their quality and in the rankings in the last uh, you know, a decade. Right. So what we need to understand is conscious efforts over a, a relatively short period of time can actually uh, significantly and dramatically transform the way higher education is evolved. But unfortunately, as one of our panelists just mentioned, we in India have not been able to get our act together. I mean, there are very serious issues with regard to the very university governance that we have. So for example, we don't, I mean, how, do, how does research come? 
it's not possible in a situation where much of our academia has been is has having an institutionalized form of mediocrity where the best and the brightest of indian graduates are no longer coming into academia Absolutely. i mean you you can go to school college university across this country and i have personally done that i've given over 600 talks and one of the questions i always ask is how many of you want to become teachers or professors and the answer is almost nil less than 5% or even less than that professor Mukher, even professor, aspiring professor rajkumar to, to academia professor rajkumar sorry to interrupt you there what i want to know is your university the president uh, yes. pranab mukherjee talks about you know privatizing education but he he also you know there is a very very important caveat he which he puts you know where he talks of social commitment also Absolutely. with these private universities Absolutely. so you, you have you been able to in your university yes, so been able to match up to that expect to those expectations well, the very much so because one of the founding visions of op jindal global university was to is to promote public service as a private university and it is created in the best traditions of non profit institutions like the ones which were created in the us i mean unfortunately in india we didn't end up creating private universities which were truly pro non profit and are research oriented right. i mean if you look at the top uh, private universities in the us be it harvard yale stanford nyu and many other leading universities they were created with a vision uh, in the private context through philanthropic initiatives Absolutely. i mean fortunately we had uh, we have uh, the you know charitable contribution of navin jindal which is established this university and in interestingly there are very interesting trends that are prevailing in india today now okay. unless and until we move towards okay. non non profit a university we would not be able to create those academic standards and research emphasis okay. which is needed okay uh, <coughs> professor agarwal we have 113 private universities as of today 129 deemed universities 285 state universities and 40, 41 central universities 113 private universities which have come up in the last 10 years i think you know do they live up to any any of those standards which we are talking of well i think uh, some of the private universities are okay yes but by and large i think this faculty shortage is professor rajkumar spoke about a very important issue a private university and not for profit university how many of these private universities are not for profit universities they are all supposed to be supposed for, to be <laughs> not for profit in fact uh, as per supreme court judgments no profiteering is allowed only they can create some surplus which has to be plowed back, back yeah uh, for the further development of uh, the institution but i think while we have islands of excellence in the central universities primarily I would say in the private universities, by and large, because they get no funding. Right. And in many cases, the fees structure also is fixed by the state government. Absolutely. Through these high court uh, appointed committees. So I think it becomes very difficult for them. And they do not have other sources of grants, either from the state government or central government. In fact, about 191 universities in the country do not get any assistance from either state or center. center. And about 20,000 colleges do not get any assistance from the state or center. So I think this large chunk, and in the private sector, the enrollment figure is about 58.9%. Right. 58.9% of our higher education enrollment is in private hands. Yes. So I think <coughs> if we want to talk about improvement of quality, we have to take care of this segment unless we improve this average quality. I think even if we have some islands of excellence in IITs, IIMs, uh, ICERs, or NITs, it won't it, suffice. It won't serve the purpose. Professor Hasnain, uh, you know, we are supposed to be having about 12% or 12 of the students who pass out of the secondary education go, goes into higher education, which we want to expand it to 30% by 2025. You know, what kind of education will the, we, we can go on expanding in terms of uh, quantity, but how do we ensure quality at the same time? Now, let me just correct yourself first. It's now, I believe, 15 percent. Okay. Or GR Almost today. Almost 20. Yes. It's, 15 it's, to 17 okay. is it's, what we, we believe it it's is. It's 20, and uh, pardon my saying, the gross enrollment ratio <coughs> is the percentage of students out of the age group of 18 to 23 years who are in higher education system. Right. So it's not those passing out from higher uh, secondary high going secondary. to higher education. Okay. Okay. I think what is needed here is we need more expansion of higher education institutions. Let me point out to one biggest fallacy in our funding regime right, right. now. Being part of the UGC as a, as a member of the commission, I was amazed to know 
that 90% of the UGC's budget on higher education goes to institutions which enroll only 5% of the students. Is that, it fair? That's quite shocking. It's, is it fair? <laughs> our state universities, they hardly get any support. 59% of, of our students go to private universities, they don't get any support. Right. I mean, we need to correct this. Right. And if the 12th plan, if we are going to look for bigger money, I think the first priority, which I'm also trying, we are trying to articulate in the commission, we need to go back and, and help and handhold the private universities and the state universities, which are living up to the expectations of good quality. Right. There's no sense in funding a central university and giving 90% of the UGC budget on an institution which only produces 5% of the students. Professor Mukherjee? Yeah, I totally agree. I think we cannot just pass the buck to the private no, sector Another now. thing which can happen here, if, 30, if we are going to raise this number to 30%, most of the students have, you know, will have no other option but to go to the, pri the private universities where the yes. fees are high and they'll not... They, this, is, this is what I'm saying, that you cannot, you do not have the option in a poor country like us. I mean, that must be factored in that this is primarily a poor country. We are not talking about the 20% middle class. Right. We are talking of a poor country. Right. And we cannot do, let us not for God's sake do what we've done to our school system. Absolutely. Hmm? And, and so that even a domestic servant sends their child not to a government school but to a private right. school. Right. Let's not do it to higher education. Absolutely. Why, why cannot we fund our own higher education? And we now have to pass it on to the private sector. However, when Mr. Jindal's university is a private university, I agree, non-profit, I agree. But what is the fees? Which, exactly. which working class person can we get will, an education we, there? We, In JNU, we are pride, proud, we get first generation learners, Absolutely. sons of agricultural laborers, Absolutely. and produce PhDs out of them. Absolutely. Hmm? No, this is when a very India does that, then we, no, we This can, is a very we important issue. We up. need to, uh, we, will, just, we will get, we will get, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, Professor. Just, quickly, what, what uh, my colleague has said. I think I'll give you the example of Hyderabad University. Yes. We have been increasing the fees. Mm. It's not that unlike JNU where the fee structure is, I must say, ridiculously low. <laughs> uh, but in Hyderabad University, the fee structure was very high, yes. very low and very high. And in my term, I mean, more than five and a half years that I was close to that, I was there. There was not a single example of a student saying that, sir, I cannot get admission because I didn't, I can't pay the fee. That's I right. think we need to create we this will, model. Okay, right. we, we right. will also get reaction from uh, Professor Rajkumar on this. But before that, we, we need to go into a short break now. Please keep watching. We'll be back very soon. Welcome back. We are looking at the state of higher education in this country and asking the question, how to ensure quality higher education? Professor Rajkumar, coming to you. These, the issues raised by Professor Hasnain and uh, Professor Mukherjee. How much does a poor student who, is, who can, cannot afford higher fees, will he be able to enter a university and if he is capable of, you know, if he wants to study there? Sure. What are well, the options all, he has? First of all, let me get the facts right for uh, Professor Aditya Mukherjee's information. Yes. Uh, as a private university, we are very conscious of the fact that accessibility is important. Absolutely. So we spend approximately 12% of our uh, you know, annual fee income towards scholarship and over 75% of our students are studying with some form of scholarship including several of them on 100% scholarship and we should, we have, we have a very skewed understanding of fee structure. We are perfectly comfortable with the idea of the leading universities of the world charging fees in the range of $75,000 to $100,000 for their fee and Harvard's and Yale's and Oxford's and Cambridge get away with it. But what we don't understand is the fee structure is what is expected to be paid by the student, but many students don't pay it. So essentially, these are funded through scholarships. So we have to recognize that what it costs to educate a person. But who pays? It is a question of how do we raise that money. Okay. So yes, I totally agree that we need to make it accessible. We need to increase our scholarships. We need to ensure that the people who cannot afford education have to be given. But let us not make any mistake that it costs uh, education costs, faculty salaries cost, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure costs. And if you want to provide all these benefits to the students, you can name any good university anywhere in the world. Professor, it is expensive. Professor Rajkumar, Who finances is a different issue. Professor Rajkumar, another issue which was raised by Professor Hasnain, handholding the UGC or the government needs to handhold some of the good private universities. Do you think 
you, 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 at your university, you would welcome something like that because I that, would that, will, that will also I would, that will also entail certain amount of uh, responsibility, responsibility and accountability. Absolutely. No, I totally agree with. In fact, unfortunately, we have a sense of pejorativeness in India about uh, private universities and private institutions. Although I must say that I have a lot of you know respect and understanding for that pejorativeness because historically, most of our private universities, I must confess, are largely commercial, mediocre and profit making and at times even dubious endeavors Absolutely. so there is a need for having good private initiatives which need to be supported okay. and when they come up the ugc and other okay. institutions should support it as well okay uh, uh, mr mr agarwal you know uh, i want all three of you to respond to this you know I, there, there was one survey which was done recently of 55000 engineers uh, passed out it firms uh, who were trying to recruit them they found that only 3% of them were employable and they all required extra training if they had to be employed and 78% were struggle, struggling in English and 56% lacked analytical skills. If this is the kind, you know, we are increasing the number of institutions, engineering colleges and technical colleges, but if this is, these are the kind of uh, students that we come out with, how do we, I mean, what is the, what is the point? Uh, I think primarily uh, the interaction between the industry and the academia yes. has been lacking Absolutely. very, very badly. In fact, in the 12th plan, they have suggested that there should be a council for industry yes. and higher education collaboration. Right. And I think that would be a, structure, a structured forum where this kind of a continuous, regular interaction must take place. But another thing which is, I think, uh, causing this low quality is the, in this uh, 21st century, knowledge corpus is doubling every few months, if not earlier. Right. And what one learns in the first year of undergraduation is perhaps obsolete by the time he gets his degree. Right. So the learning, unlearning has, and relearning. Has to be kept. You know, the learnability yeah, has we to... Are, we are completely running out of time quickly. That's yeah. why I have a couple of more issues yeah. to... Uh, Professor Hasnain, on, on this issue. I think it boils down to the fact that we are Because, you know, you are in IIT, yeah. you have been vice chancellor of... I know? think it's good to... to, to the numbers you have quoted are very good, but good to make a distinction between... Of these, how many come from publicly funded? How many come from privately funded? And you'll that, be shocked. That, that, that be and you'll be shocked. Yes. Bulk of it, 90% of it and comes from private, private engineering colleges. Okay. Because they give degrees. They don't, give, they don't impart Education. engineering skills. skills. I think that needs to be corrected. Okay. Professor Mukherjee, I know, I, I know there is another very important issue. See, some of these people were talking about, they say that, you know, including the Prime Minister's speech also, he talks about how... Uh, universities continue to provide education in, in, in areas where there are no jobs available. You know? And we talk of humanities and social science and social sciences. Most of these private universities I have found don't have humanities and social science departments. So this is another very these, major these area. These are two different things altogether. Yes. When we talk of a university, we are not talking of a vocational college. Right. Eh? So these should not be mixed exactly. up. Exactly. Universities, great universities are never created for industry jobs. Exactly. They also provide that. Eh? Right. You know, but that, that, that is not the point of a university. Right. And but as there, for there employability, be, but as for employability be... the employability will not happen hmm. because... The, uh, let me give you a statistic. 95% of Indians who go to the United States to do PhD, 95% stay there. Right. So we are not able to provide quality education and therefore our students leave. Exactly. Earlier only the PhDs used to leave, now they leave under, at an undergraduate level <laughs> because that's where they can get an education. Yes. And, and naturally they, they stay on. So how, how can we provide uh, quality uh, we, we don't even have quality teachers. Where is the question of providing well, teachers? Is a major issue. Quality. How, how do you? I mean, see, you have to raise the teaching standard. How do you raise teaching standards? By recruiting the best. As I said, recruit, recruit best. Recruit as the jindals do. Recruit globally if necessary. Right. We don't right. even recruit nationally. <laughs> right, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Rajkumar. What is your? What is it which is different in the in 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 your university? When, while recruiting teachers, because you know we t constantly talk of raising the standards of teachers. Sure. Well, as uh, Professor Mukherjee just mentioned, that I think the most important thing our universities and institutions and univ should focus on is faculty recruitment, and that cannot happen unless and until you create an enabling environment for the best of our people to come. Yours so, is one of the yours is one of the universities which has social sciences in its faculty. Absolutely, and so we one of the have few to few private universities. 
very true so we are we are we proud in the fact that we don't have we don't we didn't end up doing institu- uh, you know uh, those uh, subjects which are very commonly done in private universities right. we have we have subjects which are more focused on broadly social sciences and we are moving in the direction of starting a liberal arts school itself right. but what i really wanted to say was that faculty recruitment means that we need to reach out to uh, other parts of the world including bringing many indians from around the world Absolutely. i mean one of the things we are very fortunate is we have almost 20% of faculty are foreigners but the rest of the 80% whom we hired are indians who studied in india went abroad worked studied and were doing and want to return back to india and that's one of the important constituencies we need to attract because unless and until the reverse, we raise the, reverse the quality brain drain. the reverse brain drain okay ex- okay. exactly okay yeah. if i may just add yes. we cannot politicize the recruitment we right. cannot say the best teacher will be necessarily in this university because it is in hyderabad from telangana right. you know so <laughs> we we are we are recruiting these days on the basis of religion that the vice chancellor of jamia must be a muslim to give you an example right. or on the basis of uh, language hmm, or on the basis of caste right. now if you imagine making you know choosing a professor of neurosurgery on in on any one of these bases okay. you are dead last words to quickly uh, uh, i just wanted just to mention that uh, the country has about 8 lakh teachers in the higher education system this has to go up to 16 lakhs right. by the end of 12th five year plan right and now the qualification required is a phd right now i just want to put focus on the fact that we hardly produce 1000 phd's in engineering and technology okay. <laughs> now if we have to get this i think in the aict approved institutions itself we would need about 70 80000 phd's immediately now the total GRF, okay. you know what is called junior okay. research fellowship available. I, I think you have missed the point. Is only 50 plus 50 quickly by AICT uh, and UGC. Professor Aslan, so we have to. I'll end. just, I'll just say last one thing about why universities are languishing in research. Reason is very simple. We are now divorcing research and created centers and institutions of excellence at the cost of universities. We okay. need to undo this. Absolutely. Okay, correct. Okay, totally and that. On that note, we have to end. There are lots to be done. You know, just talking of excelling or creating better quality. doesn't uh, you know do things okay. the the key issue is there is a whole lot of things which has to be done and this has to be both a public and private way, partnership but as president mukherjee rightly pointed out social commitment to education is a very key factor thanks to all my guests uh, mr agarwal professor aditi mukherjee professor hasnain professor rajkumar please keep watching we'll come back with another issue on the big picture same time tomorrow